praise we could ever breathe. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Yes, we do. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one. the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever save. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Oh, we live for you. Holy, there is no one like you. There is none Good morning, church. Beautiful morning. Great day to be in the house of the Lord. Fellowship together and worship together. Worship our mighty God. Uh, a couple of things today. Um, avenues for giving, it's in your bulletin. There's a number of different things listed there as examples of what you can give toward. Uh, the sidewalk ministry is one of those. Uh, I think this last week we had somewhere close to 120. The week before we had over 120 people we ministered to. And uh, most of those folks, uh, folks are um, underprivileged, a uh, little short on different things. Uh, so anything you can give, whether it's uh, financial or food items that don't spoil and those kind of things, uh, we can give those away and they'd be put to good use. Um, we presently pay uh, $400 a month on our loan, so if you need a place to put your extra money, that's a good place to put it. That will expand the ministry of the church. Uh, also for crisis care units and Harvest Fest coming up in uh, the first part of November. And the Avenue 941, there's a sign-up sheet out there if you want to be part of that, the prayer support, financial support, uh, even volunteer time. Uh, that's a great ministry that we're we're getting part of, and we're getting a lot of uh, drinks and food and supplies to give away to the underprivileged in our community around the church. Um, our combined church service and potluck is May 19th, coming up soon. So make sure you cook something. I, I'll tell you why, but then you'd probably show favoritism. And um, next Sunday at 9.15... Uh, pastor is uh, starting his evangelism, evangelism class again. Uh, it's with Pastor Brett, and it's in the nursery. Uh, 
And I encourage, uh, even if you're a longtime Christian or fairly new Christian, it doesn't matter. Sometimes we need a refresher course and some of the basics. And what he's using is uh, great stuff to remind us of how to, to reach the lost for the Lord. And that's our job as a church, is to reach the lost. And his job is to prepare us to do that. And he, I think he's doing a great job with that. Uh, let's have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord. Thank you for, again for this opportunity to gather together into your house, to come as, as your, your children, as your people, Lord, as your church. We thank you that we can still do that. We thank you that you still accept us no matter what. We thank you for your great love and your mercy, Lord. So be with us today. Prepare our hearts and our minds to receive you and your word. And be as pastor as you bring the message. Use him to, to speak to our hearts. Also the music, Lord, the times of praise and worship with music is just a great time. And use that, Lord, to, to soften our hearts up to you. Be here with us, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. Stand and join us and sing your praises. I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. I will sing. 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 I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. I will sing of the mercies of the Lord. With my mouth will I make known thy faithfulness, thy faithfulness. With my mouth will I make known thy faithfulness to all generations. I will sing of the mercies of the Lord. Forever I will sing, I will sing, I will sing of the mercies of the Lord. Forever I will sing of the mercies of the Lord. I will sing of the mercies of the Lord. Forever I will sing, I will sing, I will sing of the mercies of the Lord. Forever I will sing. Of the mercies of the Lord, with my mouth will I be known. Thy faithfulness, thy faithfulness, with my mouth will I be known. Thy faithfulness to all generations. I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. I will sing. I will sing. I will sing. I will sing. I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. I will sing of the mercies of the Lord. With my mouth will I make known thy faithfulness, thy faithfulness. With my mouth will I make known thy faithfulness to all generations. I will sing of the mercies of the Lord. Forever I will sing, I will sing, I will sing, I will sing of the mercies of the Lord. Forever I will sing of the mercies of the Lord. Christian soldiers rise and press the battle ere the night shall veil the glowing skies against the foe in bells below. Let all our strength be hurled. Faith is the victory we know. Let all Victory. 
swept on our every field. Thank thee, thy wings that conquer death. Is still our shining shield. Faith is the victory. Faith is the victory. Oh, glorious victory. shall begin before the angels we shall know his name confessed in heaven then onward from the hills of light our hearts with love of faith will vanquish all the host of night in Jesus conquered Great. 
singing about God's faithfulness. The last few weeks have been pretty tough in our life with the loss of our son. And um, one thing that I have found, even when I do not understand, I can depend on his faithfulness. Amen. That is something Amen. that you don't have to question. Yep. You just depend on him and trust his faithfulness in all Amen. situations. Yep. And as we sing the prayer chorus, the spirit song, oh, let the son of God enfold you with his spirit and his love. Lift your hands in praise. If you need to come to the altar and, and just praise him. If this is an act of worship that you can come and just pray and say, Lord, Amen. thank you for your faithfulness yes. in all situations. Jesus, come and fill your lambs. It's the time of an open altar of prayer. You have a need, whatever it may be. I ask you to come at this time. Let it allow us to pray with you. I was passing this on to the message last week. I was talking to the pastor. He gave you this close to, to making it to heaven. This close. That, that's cutting it close. But I was telling you, I went into a Bible bookstore one day. I was telling him after church. I said, I went to a Bible bookstore one time to pick up some items. And there was a plaque on next to the floor, and it said, how far is too far, and how deep is too deep, and how long is too long? And the answer on the bottom was, only those that waited too long are in hell and in torment. They're the ones to give the answer. We don't know what hour or what day the Lord's going to call us home, but we need to be ready. We need to search our hearts. 
If you need change in your family and in your life, the change starts with us. Getting our hearts and our life in order to meet God and be ready to meet him at any time. If you have a need this morning, the biggest enemy you have is pride. And the altar is always open here. Anytime you want to come and pray, I encourage you to come and pray. God speaking to your heart this morning. One come, others come also this morning. A special need this morning. God knows exactly what you need. Anyone at all, come this morning and we pray for a brother here. Let us pray. Father, we thank you that the Holy Spirit comes and witnesses to each and every one of us, God, that we know that we serve an awesome God and a holy God. You know exactly how to minister into our hearts and you see the need because we know there's nothing hid that you do not know about, Father God. You know exactly what's going on and we ask you, Father, that we not find favor in your holy eyes, that your glory will saturate us and guide us and touch us and anoint our lives, God. That wherever we walk or whatever we do, they'll not see us, but see you in us. Give us a heart of love and compassion because we know, God, today, our world needs your love, your compassion, your anointing, and your touch. I pray, God, today for Israel and all the ones that's in battle, that's in arms way, that, God, you will keep them safe. I'm supporting them. I'm buying. God, I know you are. You are their chosen people, God, and we ask you, Lord, to manifest yourself upon them upon our church today. I know the pastors, he brings the word, but God, let us strive earnestly and honestly before your throne. Be a vessel for your glory, God. We'll give you the praise and ask it in Jesus' name. And everybody says, Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. Amen. Great time of prayer together, and that is what we need. We need to stop at times and just just cry out to him. Amen. Amen. I know we're going to show this later, James, but I don't know if you can put that picture up of that sensor that I had you put in my sermon. Okay. This is a picture of a sensor, C-E-N-S-E-R, and... Um, a sensor is something that they use even today. Catholics and others will use it. They will put coals down in the bottom, and they will put incense on top, and they will wave it around. And this is what the Old Testament priests would do as well. God said to do this, and it's a reminder. It's a picture of the prayers going up. And how does God smell them? They're sweet to him. They're wonderful. Your cries, your burdened cries, even your cries of where are you, Lord? If it's not a cry that I'm turning my back on you, but just a, a confused, honest, faith-filled cry, where are you, Lord? He receives that. Are you praying? Are you laying your burdens down? 
am I? It's a reminder to us to be people of prayer. It is, there is such a lightning that happens, a lightning of our spirits when we offload that heavy weight of whatever we're going through. Not that it's gone necessarily in the moment, although God could take it away, but sometimes it's still there, but you feel, oh, I'm not bearing the weight of this. My God is going to take care of it. He's working on it in his workshop. I need to keep my hands off of it. I go through the pain of it today, but I know he's working on it. I have hope because he's receiving those prayers. He is not going, oh, why don't you stop praying, right? I'm just tired of all your whining and complaining. Well, if we whine and complain, the Israelites were punished for complaining. But the honest, burdened prayers of hurting people. I'm looking you in the eye because I know you, some of you, and your burdens. Give it to the Lord. No matter how big and scary it seems, God cares about you. Praise his name. Sermonette number one. No charge for that. <laughs> okay. Well, before we move on and do our uh, <coughs> uh, choose to believe, I did want to mention, and I didn't think to have Pastor Dave mention this at the beginning, but um, speaking of reaching our community for Christ, I was listening to my, my brother Lloyd up here praying, or um, Lowell, <laughs> Lloyd, you got a new name. <laughs> Praying for souls, souls, souls. And this summer, we have an opportunity to be involved. We have some leverage. We have some people coming that will be able to help us in reaching our community for Christ, as well as sidewalk ministry every week, as well as our ministries to kids and teens going on right now. Are you praying for them right now? And everything that God does throughout the week. Uh, this summer, we're going to have a group from Trinidad and Tobago come. Uh, we know some of them, my wife and I. We were there a couple summers ago. They have a ministry with Steel Pan. It's a Steel Pan band, you know, the Calypso music. Beautiful. Uh, 28 people are coming, and uh, we'll be staying with us. We'll be housing them to save them a lot of money. And they will be ministering to our community <coughs> through Vacation Bible School and music camps teaching children how to play those instruments and introducing them to Jesus. Isn't that great? Yeah. Amen. <laughs> this is $33, $33, $33,000 that they will have to raise for this trip, but they want to do it. They want to reach people for Christ, and uh, so praise the Lord. Be praying for that. That's July 2nd through the 15th. You will be hearing more about that. But there's lots of ways that God is at work even though we don't know it and we don't see it always, God is at work. Okay, choose to believe. Are we going to choose to believe God's word this morning? All right, let's stand up and do our choose to believe then. If you're new to us or online, if, 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 we, if you believe God's word, we hold it up and we say a little phrase, uh, some phrases here that help us to remind us that we're going to listen and we're going to obey. I choose to believe God's word. I believe I can be what it says I can be and do what it says I can do. I give my mind and heart to receive the word of God. Amen. Amen. God bless you. You may be seated. Last week, as we were reminded this morning by Brother William, we heard about hell, the reality of hell the eternality of hell, the regret of hell. It is not just a place of physical pain in a spiritual body, but it is a place of regret where it says the worm does not die, meaning what we have missed. As he reminded us, we were, some people will say, how is that close? Somebody shared with me, but I put it off. But I hardened my heart. 
But I wanted to run after the things of this world a little bit longer, and I said, I'll do it later, or whatever, and later never came. Today, we also want to be reminded that souls need Jesus because not only will hell be eternal and regret will be everlasting, but because the last days of this world will be unlike any we've ever seen up to this point. As in last week's message, I pray this one as well is not uh, just a scare tactic. In fact, I don't want it to be a scare tactic at all. I want it to be truth that you say, I believe God's word. We just said we did. And we would do what it said we should do. And we should respond as we should respond. And so I'm going to believe that as God has always understood what's coming because he made the world, he has plans for it. He is heading it towards a final judgment and a final rescue for the righteous that this too, what is written in Revelation is what I'm referring to, will happen. It's not just a novel, a fictitious novel. Oh, wow, that's interesting. Hmm, wonder how that's going to happen. Ah, oh, that'll never happen, right? It will happen. And in Revelation chapter 6, which it is, it is a chapter, I'm not going to read the chapter. It is long. I will read parts of chapter 8. But in Revelation chapter 6, we see phase 1 of God's plan for wrath on the unsaved, unbelieving world. Unsaved, unbelieving world. Remember, some people, I think I mentioned last week, are unbelieving. And some are hardened. Or wicked is another word. Those are in the same category in God's eyes. You can say, well, I don't kill people. I'm not in a gang. I don't sell drugs. I'm not into human sex trafficking. I'm a pretty good person. But I am running my life. No one's going to tell me what to do. You're called wicked. You're called hardened. The other category is just as burdened and lost as that first category. I just don't believe. I don't believe there's a God out there. I think the Bible is just made up. I think it makes people feel good. It's a nice crutch for people that aren't really strong. That's unbelief. Same category, same destination. And I say this to you because I love you. God's word says it to you. I, I'm, just a, I'm just a go-between. It's just passing through my lips. God's word says, this will happen. Plan for it. In fact, that's my first encouragement to you. Do you understand? God, uh, God wants you to know what is coming. He is such a loving God, he's not going to spring it on mankind. Especially on the saved. We, if we're ignorant, it's because we haven't been in the word. We're really not listening when we're in church. We're just going through the motions. Maybe because our friends are kind of a Christian crowd and we just kind of want to, whatever. If you don't know this to be true, it's your own fault. Because God in love is warning us. He's warning us because, as I've often said, he wants us to pass the test of life. It's as if we have the cheat sheet right here. It's an open book test. People, I, I, I can't believe it. People say, oh, it's getting so bad, I can't believe it. What? You're a Christian. Have you never read the Bible? What do you mean you can't believe it? This is nothing. What we're about to talk about is way worse than what's happening right now. <laughs> you can't believe Israel is firing on Iran and Iran is firing back? You can't believe that Gaza is, is in a state of disarray and they've killed thousands of Jews? No, I can believe it. This is the beginning, God's word said, the beginning of birth pain. Now, I can't say I understand about birth pains, but I understand the concept. And they start rather lightly, don't they, women? 
and they get worse, and they intensify, and they get uh, closer together. The contractions are closer and closer together until the moment of delivery. The Bible says we are in the beginnings, or we're seeing signs, the beginnings of birth pains. God wants us to know what's coming because he loves us, and he wants us to be ready. To be ready. He's looking forward to being able to say, well done, good and faithful servant. You really listened to me. I told you it was going to get bad, and you prepared yourself spiritually, emotionally. You were ready. You used your money the right way. You spent your time the right way. You were concerned about the loss the right way, and you made it. He who has ears, let him hear. He who has eyes seeing the news, let him really see what's going on, the beginnings of birth pains. Are you preparing yourself? I'm not talking about just stockpiling cans of food. No. Are you ready? Are you ready to the point, I think we need to be ready to the point of, if they stick a gun to our head and say, will you denounce Jesus? Will you say yes? I will love Jesus. I will not denounce him. Be prepared. The moment that gun goes off, you will hear the words, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy set before you. You've been faithful in little, you will receive much. Here's a sample of scriptures that remind us that we are not the clueless ones. And in fact, those that are without Christ who are clueless, we are to share as a warning. For instance, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 and 14. Paul says, brothers, we don't want you to be ignorant about those who fall asleep. Meaning, we don't want you to wonder what happened to people that have died as Christians. Or to grieve, we don't want you to grieve like the rest of men who have no hope. We believe that Jesus died and rose again and so we believe that god will also bring with jesus those who have fallen asleep meaning those who have died in him so remember he's saying remember those that have died that trusted jesus he said it they're going to rise with him they're going to be okay everything is planned first thessalonians chapter 5 the very next chapter paul continues now brothers about times and dates we do not need to write you. Why doesn't he need to tell them about times and dates? He's going to explain it. Verse 2. For you know very well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. Meaning, we can't tell you the day and the time. Because it says not even the sun knows. But, verse 4. You brothers are not in darkness so that this day should surprise you like a thief. Well, wait a minute. If we don't know the day, if it's not going to be October 7th, 2034, how can we get ready? He says, well, you shouldn't be surprised. Even though it's going to come suddenly, you don't know the day. Why? Because you know, in general, that it's coming. You know he's returning. You know it'll get worse. Before it gets better, the contractions will get closer. They'll become more intense. There'll be more pain in the world. Which we're going to talk about in Revelation 6. I'm going to get there. <laughs> it's going to happen. We, there's no way you can be ignorant. You know what's coming. We belong to the day, verse 8. Therefore, be self-controlled. Putting on faith and love as a breastplate. And the hope of salvation as a helmet. Part of our enlightenment is just to know he has a plan. He has a plan. This world is not, has not gone to hell in a handbasket, as they say, and he's like, oh, darn, I didn't see that coming. <laughs> no, he saw that coming. He planned for that to come. He knew it would eventually become very clear, the forces of darkness and the forces of light. Before it was kind of in the shadows, right? People seem to go to church. They seem to have their life together back in the 50s or whenever you want to say was the, the glory days in America at least. And the forces of evil were kind of off in the side. You didn't hear about it. It wasn't in TV. It wasn't glaring you in the face every moment. Now it's law. 
that this and that can happen, right? Evil. It's becoming the forces and the, the, the contrast between dark and light is becoming greater and more intense until the day when it explodes. He knew this was coming. He planned for this to come. No need to be surprised. Ignorance is no excuse. And whining and moaning about this happening makes no sense. He told us this would happen. Are we scared sometimes? Of course. I'm not denying that. I get scared sometimes. But to be surprised means we don't know God's word. 1 Peter chapter 4 says, Don't be surprised by the painful trial you are suffering, as though something strange were happening to you. This is 2,000 years ago Peter said this to his Christian friends who were per being persecuted for their faith. If they weren't supposed to be surprised 2,000 years ago, we shouldn't be surprised. We've got it easier than they do. 1 John 3.13, do not be surprised again. John says, my brothers, if the world hates you. And so the seal judgments, Revelation chapter 6, the pain to come, the beginnings of birth pains include, and if you look through, and I would encourage you to look through to read chapter 6 on your own, verse 2 of chapter 6, there's going to be uh, among these seal judgments, meaning there's a scroll Back in the day, they had scrolls rolled up with wax seals impressed upon them with the seal of the king or whoever. If you were not the representative that was authorized to open that, you better not open a seal back in those days. Or the king or whoever would find out and you'd be gone. In chapter 5, they were saying, they, they saw this seal coming down from God. Meaning God wrote a letter. He wanted people to know something. But no one had the authority to open the seals. God only gave one person authority to open that scroll and reveal what he was planning. And that was Jesus, the lamb, the lamb that was slain. It says there was a lamb. He looked like he'd already been slaughtered, but he was walking around a lamb, right? Chapter five. And it says, oh, everybody's in awe. Everyone was first crying. No one can open the scroll. No one's going to know what God has planned. Oh, but we will. Because Jesus is the authorized agent that can open that scroll and reveal God's plan. Why? So we can pass the test and others will humble themselves and come to Christ. Right? Godly fear leads us to salvation, his word tells us. Godly fear. And so the son... Jesus, who looks like a lamb who's been slain because that's what he was, right? God's lamb, slain for our sins. He opens this scroll, and as he unrolls it, he begins to read. And in chapter 6, we read what God has planned, phase one of his wrath on the world. Number one is, a rider on a white horse is sent out to conquer. Now, this doesn't give any detail, at least in this place. So we don't understand, I don't understand at least, maybe some others can enlighten me later, exactly what this conquering will be. But it will be a time where, if you know what conquering means, you lose control. Someone else gains control. God is going to bring a different level of authority and control in the world. Number two, the rider on a fiery red horse will come. And he will cause people to kill each other. Verses three and four. Number three, the rider on the black horse is he'll come with a set of scales. This means buying and selling. And he will talk about how the prices of food have gone sky high. Yeah. You think it's bad now? This is the beginning of birth pains. It's no fun to go to the grocery store now, is it? Candy bars, five bucks or whatever, they, you know, stuff like this. It is ridiculous. But it's going to get worse. The rider on a pale horse is the fourth one, and he will be allowed to kill, and he will kill a fourth of the earth's population. I believe the population of the earth is seven or eight billion right now. 
So that's at least 2 billion people or around 2 billion people if it happens before a billion more come. Can you imagine that? Through plague, famine, violence, and wild animals. I didn't write it. Number five, the, the fifth and the sixth horse, horses are not, uh, the riders are not listed, or, in the, or the colors of the horses, but the fifth is a very interesting one. It shows a picture under the altar where there's worship, where there's sacrifice. And you see, it says, it, there's a picture of the people, the Christians who have died for their faith. Martyrs, not murders, martyrs, M-A-R-T-Y-R-S. Martyrs, those who have died for their faith. And they will be crying out to the Lord, Lord, when are you going to avenge our blood? This is unjust. You're a God of justice. When are you going to make things right? And he said, I definitely will. Have comfort. Be at peace. I will. But it's a little while longer. Because not all that have died for their faith in me have yet died. Wow. God is going to allow people ultimately the privilege of giving their lives as he gave his for us. And the sixth writer, it says that the sky rolled up. <laughs> What's that going to be like? I have no idea. And every mountain and island was removed. Verse 14. This is utter terror, is it not? Hello? <laughs> utter terror. And this is just the beginnings of birth pains. This is just the first set of judgments. There will be the trumpet judgments, and there will be the, uh, help me out here, somebody. <laughs> Blanking on the, the other one in the very six, chapter 16 and so forth. There are three sets of judgments, major judgments at least. So this is the beginning. It will happen. We are reminded to warn us. We say, this doesn't sound like a God of love. This is a God of love. This is the God of love who, according to Matthew 24, 14, is not going to end the world until everyone has had a chance to hear the gospel. Everyone has had a chance to hear. It says every nation. And, and Bible scholars and missiologists believe that means that everyone may not have, a, you know, a Gideon come to their door, knock on their door in Saudi Arabia or whatever, but everyone will have, let's say, for instance, uh, internet access, you know, cable TV access. They will in some way have access to the gospel to hear. Everyone will have a chance. So this is the loving wrath of God who says, for those who have refused my repeated wooing of them. You've said your final no. And only he knows when that will be, when the final person has said their final no to God. And then judgment will come. And those that have said their final yes to God will be rescued. This wrath is love. It's love for those that when all else, when everyone else was falling away, because it says there will be a great falling away from the Lord in the end times. They stayed strong. They kept to it. They kept the faith when everyone else laughed at them and put them in jail and killed their families or whatever. This is love. Ultimately, in the end, God's word is clear that some will never turn to him. And therefore... There will be eternal punishment. They cannot be allowed to be near those who are the faithful, loved of God. And therefore, God's wrath on evildoers will in the end reveal his great love to those sons and daughters whom he will heal, restore, and embrace forever. This leads to the seventh seal judgment. Remember the unrolling? And that's in chapter 8, and we will read part of chapter 8. Revelation chapter 8, 
verses 1 through 5. Revelation 8, verses 1 through 5. When he opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for a half of an hour. Wow. And I saw seven angels who stand before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. Another angel, who had a golden censer, came and stood at the altar. We already saw that picture, but we'll probably show it again. He was given much incense to offer with the prayers of all the saints on the golden altar before the Lord, before the throne, excuse me. The smoke of the incense together with the prayers of the saints went up before God from the angel's hand. Then the angel took that same censer, filled it with fire from the altar, and hurled it on the ground, on the earth, excuse me. And there came peals of thunder, rumblings, flashes of lightning, and an earthquake. This is interesting. There's a pause in heaven. There's a, a holy silence when the final revelation of that first level of wrath is revealed. <gasps> this must be a mighty, a mighty awesome thing. And then the smoke of the prayers of his people. Imagine the prayers of the people at that time of the Christians. Lord, save us. Lord, help our neighbors. Open their eyes. They're so lost. They're worshiping the stars, and they, they believe that you can, that a man can be a woman and a woman, and they believe this and that, and Lord, they believe that the universe has controlled their life, but not the God of the universe. Lord, save their souls before it's too late. And their burden cries for their family and their aches and pains and their jail time and their death sentences will go up to heaven and he will smell it and he won't say, why don't these people just leave me alone? He'll say, oh, I'm glad to smell and hear and answer those prayers. And in his great love and in his care for his people who he has listened to their prayers, he will take that same censer Love and wrath. And he will take that same censer that lifted the prayers to him and he will throw that fire at the earth and begin rumbling. Again, birth pains are getting closer. They're becoming more intense. We see this, the incredible love of God. The trumpet judgments are the ones that are in chapter 8. These are even worse than the first. A third of the land will be burned up. All the green grass will be gone. Now, if I'm around then, I will be terribly sad because I love, Abby knows, my favorite color is green, right? And I love green grass and trees. Imagine that. No green grass. A third of the land of the earth burned up. A third of the seas turned to blood, killing a third of the fish and destroying many ships. Verses 8 and 9, chapter 8. A third of the earth's water resources will be poisoned, causing many to die. A third of the sun, the moon, and the stars will turn dark, meaning a third of the daytime and even a third of the night will be darker than usual. Darkness upon the land. Pharaoh-style plagues we're talking about here. God will unleash, and then God will unleash locusts that will be like scorpions. They will have the power. They could kill, but God won't allow them to. But they will sting unbelievers, those that do not have the mark of, of, the, of God on their head. We know about the mark of the beast, but there's also a mark God's people will have, separating them. And those scorpions, those locusts that are like scorpions, will sting unbelievers for five months. And it says they will wish they could die. In fact, they will even try to commit suicide and they won't be able to. Yeah. This is how miserable this torment will be. The sixth, sixth trumpet judgment will be a death to a third of the planet through God's army of 200 million soldiers. 
by plague, fire, smoke, and sulfur that comes out of their mouths, it says. Chapter 9, verse 18. And the seventh judgment is actually mostly a time of celebration, but it will also unleash lightning and thunder, an earthquake, and a great hailstorm. Yeah. Hell is coming. Hell's the final destiny. But until then, it will get worse between now and then. The Hebrews understand, the Jews understand, that the day begins at sunset. That means it's getting dark when a new day starts. And so the new day continues and it gets darker and darker and darker and darker until it's so dark it can't get any darker. And then the light begins to shine. This is what God is showing us, his picture. It is going to get darker. Are you ready to pass that test? I don't know if anybody else can say, yes, I know I can. We don't know how we'll feel tomorrow. We don't know what's going on. But here's what I can tell you. The hope that we have is if we cling to God, which we sang about, his faithfulness we sang about, he has been faithful and he will continue to be faithful because he's made a covenant, not a contract with us. Because if it was a contract, he'd have an easy way out. Because we're faithless. We're foolish. We're embarrassing to him, I imagine. But he's made a covenant, meaning he promised he would always love us. And so he will bring the darkness, but he will hold our hands and he will give us grace even as we give our lives for him. But he promised that he will return. There will, the sun will come up and it will all be worth it. All be worth it. If you don't know Christ today, God says, I'm letting you know you can know me. I don't want you to go through this terrible, this, this terrible torment. I don't want you to go through the tribulation. I don't want you to be stung by these locusts. I don't want you to have this terrible pain. I don't want you to live a life where there's no grass and no trees and, and there, the water is poison and food is exorbitant and people are killing each other. I don't want that for you. And I definitely don't want you to say, I was that. And I had every opportunity and every warning sign and I refused it. And so I say to you online and you here in person, do you know Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior? And I didn't ask if you come to church regularly, because you do. I know who you are, most of you. You're faithful to come here. But that doesn't get us through the pearly gates. And that doesn't give us life that's beyond life here. We're missing out if we have not confessed our sin, and expressed our ultimate need, desperate need, for God's forgiveness. It is, Lord, I am a sinner. I cannot save myself by being good enough. I fall upon the mercy of the cross, upon what Jesus did for me. You are my only saving grace. And so I ask you, I confess my sins, and I ask you would help me to turn from them. Give me the strength to live a holy life now. But we'll start by, I need forgiveness. I have this heavy guilt. Lord, forgive me. We pray that prayer from our hearts, and the word says that his spirit will confirm that he heard us. Romans 8, 16, and that we are his child. I can't confirm it. He will, though. Have you prayed that prayer? If you haven't, you can today. I will lead you in a prayer of salvation. You say, well, I'm a Christian, and this really wasn't very encouraging to me. I hope it's motivational. 
sometimes maybe encouragement is not the most important thing we need. Sometimes we need a reminder. Y'all, we are not here to raise our bank account. We are not here to have the nicest house on the block. We are not here for any of the pleasures of this world. They are fleeting and passing away, and they will lead us away from the narrow path to follow God. We are not here to worry. We are here to trust the Lord. We are here to shine. We are here to be fruitful. Genesis chapter 2. The beginning of the book says, be fruitful and multiply. That's what we're here for. Are you scared? Join the crowd. Yes, me too. Do we have hope? Definitely. Are we going to make it if we stick, cling to him? Not a doubt. He's never been wrong. He's not going to be wrong now. Make a choice. Make a choice, Brett. Make a choice, congregation. Will you be involved in the world who is lost? I have a class on Sunday mornings at 9.15. I've had four or five people come. I need to be there. I need to brush up because I rub shoulders with people that need Jesus. But someday, I don't want on my heart. I mean, there'll be no pain in heaven, so I guess I won't understand. But I don't want to think, I was that close to them, and I never told them. We talked about the weather a whole lot, or the Yankees, or whatever we talked about, but I never introduced them to the hope I have in Jesus. Second Peter chapter 3, verse 11 says, Since everything will be destroyed by fire in this way, what kind of people ought we to be? You ought to live holy, holy, and godly lives as you look forward to the day of the Lord and speed its coming. And so quickly, what are we to be? Holy people, living clean in a dirty, dirty world. Are you sanctified? Do you have the power of the Holy Spirit living in your life where your heart is changed so that you have the desires of God? You're not interested in the things of the world. Can you sin? Yes. But are you interested? No. He's going to have to trick you to get you to sin because your heart is set apart for God, empowered and purified to live for him. Are you holy? Are you looking forward to the day of the Lord? Not because you want people to be punished, but you are ready for rescue and healing for all of the travesties and tragedies of this world to be undone, for recycling to finish its process. And as the scripture said, are you speeding the coming of the Lord? How do you speed the coming of the Lord? By being a witness. Because Matthew 24, 14 said he's not going to return until everyone's had a chance to hear. And so I and many others believe that that scripture means we can in, uh, speed up the time when God can finish. Bring judgment and rescue by sharing the good news. So that everyone does hear. That's why missions is important around the world. But that's why missions is important to your neighbor. Because you might or might not believe there are many people in Bradenton, in our area, that have no idea what the gospel is. I've talked to people that don't even know what a pastor is. They don't know what a church is. They don't know what a Bible is. They don't know what a sermon is. Kids on this block. This block right here, they didn't know I was, what a pastor was when I told them, what a Bible was, what a sermon was. Go and tell. Speed the coming of the Lord. And so now I'm going to lead you. If you would like to pray and receive Christ as your Savior, let's stand together, please.
I find it amazing, but I want to humbly say, even if you have come to church here for a long time, but you've never confessed your sins, you can today. I invite you to. I will lead you to pray a prayer with me or online. Lord Jesus, please forgive me for my sins. Please forgive me for the things I've done and said and thought that were away from you, against you, uninterested in you, rebellious against you. I don't want to do those things, think those things, act that way, say those things anymore. I want to live for you a holy life. And so please forgive me now. Come in and wash away my sins. You're my only hope. And make me new. Come into my heart and life that I can start living for you. Give me strength to live for you in my world. Thank you for forgiving me now. I receive your forgiveness. Amen. And now I pray for you, my believing brothers and sisters. And by the way, if you feel an urge to come to the altar, run. Lord Jesus, we call out to you. We are your people. We want to be faithful as you are faithful to us. We want to fulfill our part of the covenant to live for you as children that really act like you. Help us in that process, Lord, of becoming more dependent on you and less on ourselves, of turning from any slight bit of darkness in our lives, confessing it, making no excuses for it, that you might truly have our whole life and sanctify us wholly for service. We pray, we look forward to the day of the Lord. But until then, Lord God, may we stay busy, not about trivial stuff that will pass away, but about souls and missions, lives that need Jesus, and discipled as well. Thank you, Father. My brother, Pastor Dave, is going to come and close the service. powerful message. I'd like to um, say a couple of words about holy people. We're called by God to be holy people. We're commanded by God to be holy people. We can't do that in our own strength. We need the Holy Spirit working in and through us. I pray you've asked him into your heart. If not, you can do that this morning. Also, we ought to be looking forward to the day of rescue. We need to be looking forward to that. But at the same time, looking around us. We have family members in our family close family members that don't know Jesus. We have friends that don't know Jesus. And we try to model the behavior that Jesus tells us to model, living a life of holiness in front of those folks, not just with our words, but with our actions and our doings. Like Paul says, we just don't want to be a bunch of noise. James says, if you have faith, there should be works with that. If we love Jesus, we should be doing the things that Jesus would have us to be doing. Someday we're going to stand before him. He may say, good job. But he also is going to say, why didn't you talk to Joe? Why didn't you talk to Evelyn? Why didn't you stop at that store that I told you to stop at? We're going to be asked some tough questions. 
We'll do the things now that will eliminate those kind of questions then. We're commanded to be holy. We're commanded to look forward. And we're commanded to speed his coming. And we do that by not just reaching out to others that we may know or encounter in this life. But we do that through prayer. Consistent prayer. Daily prayer. We're told pray constantly, all the time. And ask for him and his guidance. And we will succeed in whatever he calls us to do. Think on these things today. If you need help, come forward. The altars are here. Pastors are available. People are available to talk to and to pray with. So come as I pray today. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for this this message today that speaks to our heart about how close your coming is. You tell us when we see these things happening, when you see the, the nation of Israel and Jerusalem surrounded, then you know it's at the door. And that's what we're seeing today. We're seeing all these things that Pastor Brett talked about. They're all happening. So many things have happened in the last 25 years, especially, that it's gotten worse and worse and worse and worse, faster and faster and faster. Lord, we need your help, not just to survive through all this for ourselves, but with our friends, families, acquaintances, who, whoever you bring into our lives, Lord. We need your help. We need your guidance. We need you to, 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 to be with us and use us. We're all called to do something. We know that. So we ask you to help us to see that calling, recognize that calling, and act on that calling. Thank you, Lord, for this opportunity to be in your house today. Thank you for all these folks here, Lord. We ask you to bless them as they leave this place and watch over them and keep them safe, Lord. We ask in Jesus' most precious name, amen.